I am so excited because we're going to be starting a new series today, five weeks. We're going to be looking into the book of Romans, chapter 8, and we're going to spend five days, uh, five days, five weeks diving into Romans, chapter 8. Personally, for me, this has probably been the most influential chapter in the Bible for me understanding who I am, what my identity is in Christ, and changing my life completely. And so today we start with this concept, this idea that we're going to be replacing condemnation with confidence, replacing condemnation with confidence. Now, um, I have some definitions in your program there if you want to look with me, but condemnation is to feel guilty, disapproved of, unfit, or judged against. Confidence, on the other hand, is to feel as if you can live life boldly without fear of the past or the present. And so there is a stark contrast between condemnation and confidence. Now, one of the, the hindrances to confidence in our life is this idea of guilt and shame. Now, guilt and shame are a little bit different, but they're kind of like brother, sister, or cousins or something. So guilt is, I've done something bad and I feel bad. But shame is, I am bad. At the core of who I am, there's just something wrong with me. And so here are some signs that you may struggle with guilt and shame. One, I, I despise myself. Maybe some in here that wouldn't admit it, but in your heart, you're like, I just despise myself. Secondly, I see God is disgusted with me. You know, some of you just believe that, you know, unless you become a missionary in Africa and you get eaten by cannibals or something, God's not going to be a, uh, approving of you. You got to just be crazy like that. Uh, I, I discount my positive. Are you that kind of person when someone pays you a compliment? I know I do this sometimes. Oh, no, that's not, oh, that's, I'm not really that good or whatever. And somebody, you kind of deflect the compliment. I brag about my flaws. Um, criticism of what I do as to who I am. So somebody maybe gives you some feedback and you then right away you take that and say, oh, I'm just a bad person. I just feel negative about myself. Uh, what about those that project guilt and shame on others? You've met people like this. They pound people verbally or maybe even pound them physically, you know, but there's something inside of them and they're constantly projecting this shame and this guilt. Have you ever met people who walk up to you and you're like, uh, are you mad at me? Are we okay? And there's this constant like needing of a reassurance of insecurity. It's like, are, we, are you mad at me? Like, no, but after the 10th time you asked me, like, I'm actually mad at you now, you know? Uh, and so there's this insecurity that we walk around with. But here's the cool thing about confidence. Here's the benefits of confidence. And this is as we, we dive into Romans 8, we're going to understand how to experience true confidence in God. But here's some benefits of confidence. We just have better relationships when we're confident. We're able to handle stress better. We're able to help others and be in a position to help them. We're more productive. We assume leadership positions. And so when you're, when you're living life confidently, there's so many benefits. So we're going to jump right into Romans chapter 8. And I want to start off, the first point is this. Um, if I want to replace condemnation with confidence, I must believe God's forgiveness is real. Believe God's forgiveness is real. Now, some of you have heard this millions of times. Others of you, you're hearing it for the first time. I want you to circle that word real there in the point. Because for so many of us, we can hear that word, okay, we're forgiven, but to truly understand it in our hearts and allow it to transform our lives is a completely different thing. But look at what the Bible says, that we don't go off of our feelings, we go, go off of the true word of God. And this is what it says, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. So now, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to circle, if you're taking notes, that word, no condemnation. I looked up the original language for no, and it means no. It means zilch, <laughs> nada, goose egg. However you want to say no, it means no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Verse number two. 
And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Verse three, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. The law of Moses, you can, you can uh, underline that. And you know what the law of Moses is? It's the 10 commandments. And so what the Bible says is that trying to keep the 10 commandments, trying to be a good enough person was, un, it was insufficient to save you. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice. Circle that word and by, next to it, put cross. That's where Jesus hung as a sacrifice for your sins. Verse four, he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit of God. And so behind me, as you see, we've got this white bar, board here. You know, Jared, I actually needed that now, man. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. He was right. So actually, I'm going to put this back here. And um, this doesn't give me a lot of space. So if I end up falling off this, just could you tell my family that I love them? Uh, so can you see this? This is really sketchy, actually. Okay. Well, <laughs> Like, so I fall off or like, you want me to go this way? Oh, can you guys, can you guys all see this? Yeah, okay, you're good, you're good. All right, so um, here's what, here's, let me give you a visual of what the passage is talking about. So the reality is this, is that we're over on this side and we are people, men and women, boys and girls. And what, ha what happens is that um, we're over on this side we're gonna represent God with green, okay? So green represents life. And this is God. Now, God is 100% holy and righteous all the time. And so because we are not, the Bible says that we have sin in our lives, and even though we try to keep the Ten Commandments, we don't always do that. And we think, well, if maybe God will grade us on a curve. And that's how I believed for most of my life, that if, if I had got seven out of 10 right, I'm good. But the reality is God is 100% holy. He's perfect. And so there can't be any sin. If there's any sin, it has to be punished. And so you look at the things that we, we do, and you know the Bible says the, the Ten Commands, adultery, we steal, we, uh, we lie, dishonor our parents. Uh, you know, we... Uh, we we make images and we worship things other than God. And so there's these things in our lives and this sin that separates us from a holy God. Now, I'm gonna share a quick little story with you, but uh, you guys all know that Kmart burned down. Yeah, I was okay with Kmart burning down. I'll just, I'll be honest with you. And, and not for reasons why you think, but you see, Kmart represented for me a, a time of my life of, of condemnation. I, when I was a teenager, I used to go into Kmart and I would steal things. And I was good at it. Like I was a good stealer. I actually lived in Pittsburgh because I was awesome. So you're like, that's a dumb joke. But I would go into to Kmart and steal stuff when I was a teenager. And so um, when Kmart burned down, it was like almost like there was this representation of some of the things of my past. Because some of you, you stand, you're sitting in here right now and you go, man, Billy, you're talking to a church crowd, but you don't know my past. You don't know, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the kind of sexual sin that I have in my past. You don't know the kinds of things that I've done in the past to hurt people. You don't know those dark seasons of my life that follow me around and I just experience this regret over and over and over again. Billy, you're not, you don't understand who you're talking to. Well, this is the cool thing about the passage in Romans chapter eight is that God does something. He ends up sending his son, Jesus Christ, on a cross, okay? So this is Jesus. And Jesus is our perfect representation. 
He lives a perfect life and then he dies as a sacrifice to forgive all of our sins so that there's no condemnation. And now he is the, oh yeah, you guys are getting it now. He's the bridge that separates sinful people from a holy God. And so our righteousness now is not based on our own efforts. Our righteousness is based on what Jesus has done for us. And so you know what's kind of cool? Uh, there's two things that are certain in my life, are certain that I understand. One is that Kmart is gone. And secondly, my sins are gone. And so we can, I can stand before God and I can, I can look back and what does he do? He takes this big eraser, this big mega eraser, and he looks at my life and he says, yeah, you've, you've messed up. But because of my, my son, I forgive you. And now you are clean. This is, this is the uh, difference between every other uh, religion and Christianity. You see, every other religion is spelled D-O, that I've got to do something. I've got to earn God's favor. I've got to just be good enough. And if I could, if I could be good enough, then somehow God's going to love me and, and like me. And, and there's days when I'm not that good and I don't feel very good. And I know God's really mad at me. And, and so I feel that shame and that guilt. But then there's other days when I'm feeling like a little bit better than the guy next to me. And so I feel a little bit better and I'm not, you know, and we just kind of go through this thing. You can have a sh assurance of salvation and it's based on why? Because Christianity is not spelled D-O. O N E or a D O D O Christianity is spelled D O N E. Everything that was necessary for your salvation was done through Jesus Christ. And so now I find my identity in him. And now when God looks at me, he looks at me through the, the, the lens of his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And now he goes, that's my son whom I'm well pleased with. That's my daughter whom I'm well pleased with. And it's not based on what we feel. It's based on what he did for us. That's the cool thing. When God says there's no condemnation for those who what? Belong to Christ Jesus. It means now you don't have to try to work your way to heaven. It's a gift. That's the beautiful thing about the church. And then now we've become the bridge to go tell this to a world that's hurting and needs to know that they don't have to live under a cloud of condemnation any longer, but they can live in a cloud of, of, of confidence and of identity. And so Jesus is our, he's our cross. He's our bridge that bridges us. Now, now once we become a follower of Jesus through the gift of Jesus Christ and what he did for us, we begin to want to change our lives. We want to change because God forgives us past, present, and future and so we are secure in him no matter what we're doing. But the Bible talks a lot in Romans 8 about this idea that we have this thing called the sinful nature. And the sinful nature is what opposes God's law, or opposes God's will in our lives. And so we've got this thing in us that just causes us to gravitate towards things that are wrong. And we've got temptations in our life. But what we have to do is if we want to grow in Christ, not earn his salvation, but if we want to grow and become more like him and more pleasing to him, secondly, if you're taking notes, is we have to change our stinking thinking. I got to change my stinking thinking. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit Think about things that please the Spirit. Verse 6, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Verse 7, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. And so in order for us to begin to change the way that we live, we've got to change our thinking because our thinking then changes our behavior. And we have to begin to believe things about us. You see, 
God's, you know, we've got this accuser called the devil, and he's constantly going to accuse you. And even though you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, in those moments, he's going to come in and he's going to say, well, you remember that season of your life? Or you remember that thing that you did? Or you remember that regret? And he's going to come in and try to remind you of the things that you did that separate you from God. And then it's going to cause you to feel like, well, I'm not really worthy, and God really can't love me. And, and you get down and you start thinking about guilt and shame and condemnation, and God's saying, no, 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 no. You've got to, I, I want to do some brainwashing here with my, with my word, with my truth, and you start to replace some of those, those lies with God's truth, and you realize, no, God loves me. I've called you to a higher standard that nothing can separate me from your love, and so we have to change our thinking. Um, of all the things that people have accused me or have called me in the past, a neat freak is not one of them, okay? I don't know about you, but there are some thoughts that run around in my head like this. Why would I ever make my bed just to know that I'm gonna go and sleep in it later on that night? Okay, some of you, gotta, you gotta help me out here. Why would I put the toothpaste cap back on the toothpaste if I know that I'm gonna be using it the next morning? Summer, or, or next week, or whatever. I'm just kidding. <laughs> know the truth, this is it, man. I remember when I was a teenager, and I would just put everything on the floor, and because everything had, its, in my mind, everything had a place on the floor, and so it was organized, but my mom didn't think so. And here's my mom in the audience. Do you remember what you used to do, mom? So she, she used to put, she would go in and like, want me to clean my room so she would gather all of the stuff on my floor and she would put it where? On my bed. Thinking I was gonna go and go, oh great, now I'm gonna hang up that shirt or whatever it is. And so I would go and do this, what I call the windshield wiper, and I would just, <laughs> and it would go back on the floor again. You tried, mom, I'm, I'm thankful, I love you. I <laughs> just closed the door. But then, uh, I got married. <laughs> and Elissa was so patient with me. In fact, she was okay with my habits if I was okay with sleeping outside. And I remember just having to, to make some changes, and I wanted to make those changes. And I started learning, like, oh, you mean you, you actually, uh, there's, there's two of the same pairs of socks, and you wear those t socks on the same, like, I started thinking about things that I had never thought about and never were important to me, but I was introduced to a higher standard of thinking. And so, you know, like I said, I, I got reintroduced to those muscles that put the, um, the shirt on the hanger, and I had to kind of admit to myself, hello, I'm Billy, and I hate vacuuming, you know, and I just had to admit important things in my life, and I started to change. But then the moment of truth came. When my wife was going to go away for a few days, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so cool because I am going to wait until the 11th hour until she's back home and I'm going to go and, you know, make sure I get everything cleaned up. But for a few days, I'm just going to kick my feet up and relax. I'm going to just spill stuff all over the carpet. Like, I'm not even going to care. I'm going to be the slob that I think I am. And I'm going to, but you know what happened? It was crazy. I saw those dishes in the sink and I'm like, I'm uncomfortable with that. I, I'm actually gonna go wash, wait, it's the first day and I'm actually doing stuff right now? And, and I actually realized that my thinking had changed and that thinking had caused my behavior to change. And this is the cool thing. It all started because I love my wife and I know that she loves me and I wanna do things that please her. I wanna have this relationship with her, not because I'm trying to earn her love, but because she already loves me. And so I started to do things and I, I started to clean things and by no means, you guys, Am I a neat freak still? I mean, there are socks somewhere in my house right now, laying somewhere behind a couch, something. But I'm a lot, I'm a lot better than I used to be. I've grown a lot in that area, and it all started with believing and thinking something differently. It's the same thing that we're, we're kind of, we come to God kind of like this mess. 
and God says, I'm gonna save you and there's no condemnation and I love you and come as you are, but I love you too much to keep you in that mess and I want you then to practically begin to trust me and believe me and allow your thinking to change so then you can become more like me. Why? Because he loves you. It's not out of obligation. It's not out of like, oh, I've got to do this and follow these rules. No, it's because you've got a God who cares so much about you. He knows better than you know, and he wants you to live life to its fullest. And so we live that way. Look at this passage in Romans chapter 12, verses, uh, verse two. Um, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And this is another verse here in Philippians chapter four, verse eight. So fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And so you just start to filter the thoughts in your head. And are these thoughts gonna make me be more like Jesus or are they gonna cause more condemnation in my life? Are these thoughts gonna allow me to have more confidence in my life? And you begin to literally frisk every thought. Don't believe every stupid thought that comes into your head. And they come from different directions and different reasons and stuff. But you then begin to discern the thoughts and you begin to think about those thoughts and go, you know what, that's not true. God says I'm loved and that I'm his prized possession that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for me and I'm worth a son to him. Like I don't have to live with this condemnation any longer. I can live with confidence and it's not a confidence that I've established, it's a confidence that he's established. And so you change your stinking thinking. And then thirdly, if you want to replace your condemnation with confidence is you have to experience the power of God's spirit. Experience the power of God's spirit. Now, some of you say, well, what is God's spirit? Like that just sounds kind of churchy. Some of you, maybe you haven't been in church that long and you go, what does that mean? Well, God is three in one, the Bible says. You've got the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And they are all three co-eternal, they are co-equal, and yet they're distinct and they're different. It's a, it's a mystery of the Bible, but God is three in one. And when you come into a relationship with God, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, who then comes to live in your heart, And he saved you and he he says, there's no condemnation in me. But then what he does is he then gives his spirit to you to live the kind of life that brings honor to God. Look at this passage in Romans chapter eight, verses nine through 11. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled, circle that word and put yield by it. You are controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of God living in you. I'm teaching my daughter how to drive and there's this little roundabout in Windsor as you go through Old Redwood Highway. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And there's that sign that says yield. And I just blow through that yield sign quite often. So when she's in the car the other day, she's in there and I'm like, you gotta yield. And she's like, dad, you don't even yield. Why should I yield? I'm like, oh, great. But, but here's what it means to yield. It means to wait and let the other car go by. So what does it mean to yield to the spirits working in our hearts and lives? It means I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna stop doing things my way, I'm gonna let you go by, I'm gonna let you go first, and I'm then gonna follow your lead. And that's what Christianity 2, this is Christianity 101. Christianity 201 is I now am going to yield to the Holy Spirit working in my life to change me and make me like his son Jesus. In parentheses in that second part of Romans chapter, uh, or uh, verse nine, and remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. Verse 10, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Circle that, made right with God. That's eternal salvation right there. Verse 11, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Just in those two verses, you've got the spirit described three times. In this short verse, chapter eight, 39 verses, the spirit is described 
19 times. 19 times. And people will ask me, is it hard to live the Christian life? And you know what I tell them? It's absolutely impossible to live the Christian life on your own strength. If you're trying to live this life apart from God's spirit, but with God's spirit, he gives you, the Bible says, this resurrection power where you now have strength over temptation and you have victory over your life and you can now make the changes. Why? Not because you're strong, but because you surrender to God. It's a completely different thought process. Everything in our life has told us, work harder, just, just be stronger. And God's saying, no, I want you to surrender and submit your heart to me more, and then I'll begin, I'll begin to do this work in you. And the work, sometimes it's, it's difficult work. Experience the power of God's spirit. Don't just learn the power of God's spirit. So many Christians and so many churches, we can learn this intellectually, but the Bible says that God's spirit, if you have Jesus Christ, lives inside of you. That changes everything. You now, you don't have to live in condemnation now, you can live with confidence. And it's not just this fake, you know, you meet some people and they've got this kind of aura about there, like, hey man, I'm confident and I'm putting on this front and everything's cool, but it's kind of rooted in this insecurity. No, when we walk with confidence as followers of Jesus, there's this deep rooted confidence that is based on God's love for us and based on what he said about us. And so now our confidence is rooted in security. It's rooted in God, some of you, you, you've been thinking for, for years that God is just angry with you. Maybe you've been through some difficult times and you're thinking that somehow God is just punishing you, that God really doesn't have your best interest in mind. I just want you to say, wipe that clean and know that God loves you, that God has done everything that he can to have a relationship with you, that for some of you right now, he's calling you into that relationship and to experience his love and his spirit. You know, in the second half of verse nine, it says, and remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. What I wanna do is I wanna give you an opportunity if you don't have the spirit of Christ living in you, if you don't have that God's strength living in you because you've never received this gift of eternal life and forgiveness through the sacrifice of his son Jesus, then I wanna invite you to receive that gift today. It's a gift that he offers to everyone, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter who you are, he's calling everybody into his love and into relationship. So let's pray to him right now. God, thank you for Romans chapter eight. Lord, for this truth, there is no condemnation, Lord. God, help us to believe that that is true Help us to understand that as your spirit works in our hearts, to really believe that and then to, to live our lives from that. I wanna pray for anyone in here that has never put their faith in you, Jesus, that just right now in their hearts, they would say, Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross to be a sacrifice in my place I confess my sins to you and I lay down my guilt and I lay down my shame and I lay down my condemnation at the foot of the cross and I say, God, I can't carry this any longer. I give it to you. Thank you that my salvation is a gift that I don't have to earn. And knowing that, Lord, now I want to live life that pleases you, a life that honors you. And so I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit to give me the strength to make the changes that bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.